Okay, good morning, everybody. And we're going to begin with prayer. Father in heaven, we just thank you for being good to us. We thank you for your word, for allowing us to understand you and to realize your love for us. Let this time that we spend together be profitable, help us to understand and to leave better than how we came because of this study today. We ask in Jesus' name, amen. All right, we're going to try to make up for lost time. So instead of going straight to today's lesson, we're gonna go back a little bit, capture some highlights from lessons that we missed because we were at camp meeting and also because we were honoring our first elder who passed away. And so let me share the screen and uh, you'll see what we're doing. Okay, and do you see I wrote um, four lessons compilations, okay? So this is where we left off. The theme for the last quarter was the covenant. And, and uh, I just felt that we couldn't just just um, to stop without finish, really finishing it. So we got a lot to accomplish in a little bit of time. If we can go back to June 12 through 18, this is where we would have been. We've been studying the covenant from the time God made promises to Adam and Eve when they sinned. Um, and then there was a covenant with Abraham. There was a covenant at Mount Sinai with Moses. Then there was a new covenant. There was a covenant and I, I left out um, Noah. And so we didn't wanna just, just all of a sudden quit. And so this is where our memory verse would have been but that no man is justified by the law in the sight of God, it is evident for the just shall live by faith. One of the things that, one of the concepts that has gone through all of our lessons is that God wants us to have faith in him. He wants us to have a relationship with him. And even though we have obligations on our part and to understand our obligations, God did give us laws, but those laws are not the criterion by which we have eternal life. And so this lesson um, that we missed it just, this lesson just reiterated that. The distance between heaven and earth is too great for us to atone for our own mistakes. If we get home, if we get to heaven, if we spend eternity with God, it would have to be only by the grace of God. God in this lesson is pointing to us again to a theme that has repeated over and over and over again, that yes, there are things God wants us to do. There's a way he wants us to live. We have some obligations for our part of this covenant, this agreement, but those laws, that is not what saves us. In this lesson, which we won't go through, we're just looking at these highlights. This lesson brought out why salvation is a gift. It has to be a gift. Why could only someone equal to God ransom our souls? What makes Abraham such a good representative of faith? What does it mean that righteousness is imputed or credited to us? How can we make the promises of hope found in the cross our own? Those were the highlights 
of the lesson that we missed three weeks ago. And one of the things that came out strongly in this lesson, and I hope everybody got it, and it's been repeated over and over, the old covenant, the new covenant, Jesus paid the debt owed by the law so that we can stand righteous in the sight of God. Some people think, some Christians believe that, oh, the old covenant was a way of obeying laws to win, to earn your eternal life. Even in the old covenant, we've, we've studied it. We've looked at it. It's not different from the new covenant in that those laws were never, even back then, they were never there so that we could try to to earn our way to heaven, never, not in the old, not in the new. And that was what was important in that lesson. Now, before we look at the highlights of lesson 13, which was the last lesson in that quarter, were there any questions about anything that was in this lesson that was covenant faith? We are saved by grace through faith. Any questions? If you think you got it, at least say got it or raise your hand or put up that thumb in the on the computer or let Amen. me know. Amen. Okay, great. So now let's look at what did we miss from lesson 13? The last lesson, this was the culmination of all that we had studied about God wanting to have a relationship with us. God wanting to have uh, an agreement that he's our God and we're his people. And so the memory verse for that lesson was, let me get back to it, I am come that they may have life and that they may have it more abundantly. Jesus came to fulfill the covenant. However, sometimes we think the covenant means obey all the rules and then you go to heaven. The covenant is we have a relationship and at the end of that relationship, there is eternal life. However, in the meantime, while we are on this earth, we should have a good life here. We should have a life that has joy in it, that has peace in it, that has success as we define it, even here. And so when Jesus came, yes, he came to fulfill the promise of eternal life. But he came that we might have life even now, and that what we enjoy on this earth now would be abundant. Okay, in this um, week, which was the last of, of this theme, God tells man how he's going to save us. Also, that with this covenant relationship, we studied in this week that we should feel joy and the basis on which we claim God's promises. What is it about the covenant that should free us from the burden of guilt? And what does it mean to have a new heart? The covenant is not just some deep theological concept. 13 weeks before this lesson, probably a lot of us thought of when we talk about the covenant, oh, we're talking about some deep biblical stuff, some deep th theological concepts. But instead, the covenant defines the, the parameters, the guidelines, of our saving relationship with Christ. 
of relationship that reaps us wonderful benefits now, even now, and when he returns. So what were some of the benefits that we would have studied? One of them was joy. And, and God said to us in 1 John 1 through 4, that these things he writes, all of the, what we study in his word, learning and understanding the history of mankind, getting to know God better. What's all that for? These things we write unto you that your joy may be full. If something is going on in your life and you're feeling depressed, you're feeling down, you don't have any happiness. There's no friendship. The Bible will tell us how we can how we can grab those things even now. That's a part of the covenant. And this is this, I love this text, Romans 8:1 was in this lesson. There is therefore now, right now, no condemnation to them which are in Christ Jesus, who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Jesus didn't come to condemn us. He didn't come so that he could just check out, are they following all those laws? And God didn't, didn't give all those laws so that we would have to um, walk a strict, strict line and then be judged as to whether we stayed on that line or did we fall off. He didn't come to condemn us. The laws aren't there to condemn us. They're there to help us have a closer walk with God. So he says, um, there is no condemnation for us who walk not after the flesh, but after the spirit. Okay, and then in this lesson, there was a mission. Now, some lessons back, we learned that there are obligations. God gives us so many promises. He expects something from us, and what he expects from us isn't difficult. And it's not there just so that he has something to judge us on. Even his obligations are to bring us joy. And here we see that with the new covenant, we're told that we have a work to do. We have a mission. Do you know people get depressed when they feel like, well, what is life? There's nothing. We're just born, we go through, we die. If we don't have a mission, if we don't have something to accomplish, something is missing in our life. And when God gives us a work to do, that work actually brings us joy. So he gave us a mission. And the mission was to go ye therefore and teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the world. So we have a mission, we have a work to do, and that work actually brings joy. We know why we're here. We know we have a purpose. The burden of meaninglessness. That's what some people think for well, the world. The life, life's meaningless. People find themselves with the gift of life, yet they don't know what to do with it. They don't know what the purpose of the gift is and they do not know how to use it. It's like giving someone a library filled with rare books, only to have the person not read the books, but use them to build a fire. What a, wear, what a terrible waste, something so precious. Our mission is precious, and it is a part of the covenant. So, 
That's how we ended that theme, reminding us that the covenant brings joy. The covenant also brings um, a mission to us. And there was something else, and I don't know why I didn't have it highlighted here. In that lesson, it also said that the covenant, being in a relationship with God, it takes away guilt because we're going to always make mistakes. We always fall down. We have to get back up and we can get up and not have to carry the guilt of the mistakes that we've made. All of that is a part of the covenant. Any questions about anything on the covenant as we leave it and go into a brand new theme? Anything, anybody? Okay, I, I really, I loved that, um, that quarter. And I'm thinking that that is such a beautiful quarter, especially for new believers. And as we um, fulfill this mission, going into the world, baptizing people and teaching them what we know, this covenant relationship is a good way to start, to let them see how in the very beginning, Adam and Eve made a mistake, but God was right there with promises to them and telling them how they still can live a good life right now and how they can be saved eternally. And what he said to them, he continued to say throughout all of the history of the Bible. And he's saying it to us now. All right. With all of that said, now we go to the new quarter. A brand new theme. And it's rest in Christ. There's a story in the quarterly. Before you even get to the first lesson, it was a, um, and I hope you've studied it and read it about a little girl who was on an airplane and the airplane was having some problems and um, was having problems because a major storm was coming. And so the announcement was made, tighten your seatbelt. We will be in for quite a ride. This ride is gonna be bumpy. There's gonna be some problems. And the people on the plane uh, they were tense, they were nervous. Um, some of them were frightened, but everything was okay at the end. But someone noticed one little girl who never seemed scared while everybody else was tense and nervous and scared and depressed and going through all kinds of things. She didn't seem to be that way. And someone asked her um, why, you know, why she wasn't scared. And she said, I wasn't scared, the little girl said, to the surprise of the man who was asking her. My dad is the pilot, and I knew he was taking me home. And so this whole lesson kind of has that theme while we're on this earth. There are going to be so many ups and downs and bumps and, and situations that make us scared. There are things that make us sad. There are things that make us nervous. Some people even get to the point where they give up. But this whole quarter, we want to know and realize, understand and believe and claim claim the promise that it's going to be okay because our father is the pilot and we need to know he's taking us home resting in christ is the key to the promise of the type of life that jesus promises to his followers the thief doesn't come except to steal and to kill and destroy. Who's the thief? Who always wants to take away our joy, wants to steal what we have, wants to 
to kill our spirit. But Jesus says, I have come that they may have life, that they may have it more abundantly. That's what this quarter is about. Doesn't that seem hopeful, exciting? <laughs> that to know God wants us to be sure, to understand that he wants to give us rest. And that rest means peace. That right rest means joy. That, that rest means love. You know, when you think about the fruit of the spirit, peace and joy and love and understanding, faithfulness and goodness and kindness and, and uh, long suffering. All of those things are the kinds of things that God wants to give us. So it started with last week's lesson, living in a 24 seven society. <sighs> This society we live in, and uh, we've been on the road. I mean, there are certain places that we've been since I've been on vacation. We have traveled from Maryland all the way to the West Coast, and now we're on our way traveling back east. And we have seen some places where there was hardly any traffic. But then there were some places where we can't believe the traffic we've seen and people in a hurry. And uh, with it, with the speed limit says 70 and they're racing past us, like they gotta get to some place in a 24 seven society. How in the world do you rest? And this was last week's lesson and it was, David, who said, my soul longs, yes, even faints for the courts of the Lord. My heart, my flesh cry out for the living God. There's so much going on that we long for this peace, for this rest that God has promised us. And just like um, David, our hearts are crying out for what God wants to give us. In this lesson, and we're not going to read through everything because, you know, we're racing for time. We're racing. Okay. But um, if we were to read Genesis 2, 1 through 3, we would find out why would God we, we would find out that God created a day of rest. When God created this world, before there was that 24 seven rat race, before any of that, God created the earth and then he put in place a Sabbath rest. Why would God create a day of rest before anyone was even tired? So I want somebody to answer that. Why would God implement a day of rest before anybody was even tired? Anybody? I, I, I thought it was to be an example. Say what you mean by that, to be an example. example. Uh, an example of how we were going to need to take rest and take breaks so he exhibited it for us. Mm -hmm. Right. That's exactly what I was going to say, that I know he knew that it was, a time was going to come when we really needed the rest, because mm -hmm. I guess keep going, you know, so much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Right. He knew. He knew what was going to happen. And he said, he showed us the pattern. He showed us, this is how you're going to do it. You're going to work for six days, just like I just did. But on the seventh day, Turn the channel. Just your whole body, your whole mind, your whole spirit needs to go to another place. And then what did he mean by that rest? Defining rest. Now, 
for those of us who've been Seventh-day Adventists a long time, when I came into this church, the rest that um, I was told about wasn't rest. And I'm so glad our church um, has helped me study the Bible more and understand that I mistook what they were saying and so did a lot of people. Now tell me those of us who've been here a long time, so that's me and you, Doris, and a few others. <laughs> when we came in and we learned that there's a Sabbath day of rest, it wasn't told to, it, it wasn't explained to us a day of rest, it was a day of restriction. This is a day that you cannot do A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, J, K, L, M, N, P, Q, R, S, T, U, V, W, X, Y, N, Z. Don't do any of that stuff. And so for every moment of the 24 hours of the Sabbath, check yourself. I can remember even my father coming into, uh, knocking on the door of our bedroom, we had just become Adventists. And, we'll, and we'd go to our room and we would talk. We even studied, go over the Sabbath school lesson. But if he heard us laughing, if he heard us laughing, he would say, what you doing in there? You must be breaking the Sabbath because I hear too much laughter. So it was, don't, 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 don't. But if we look at what the word really means, going back to the Hebrew and, and what those words mean, the old Hebrew Testament, for instance, includes a number of terms denoting rest. The description of God's resting on the newly created Sabbath day in Genesis 2, 2 and 3 uses the verb Shabbat, to cease work. I didn't really, really enjoy Sabbath like I do now until I really had a job that I had to go to and was so glad not to have to go to it. And even I even began to enjoy not doing stuff in the house. It wasn't a restriction. It was a joy to take a break from all of that, to cease work, to rest, to actually let your body exhale. And it also means to take a holiday. When we have a holiday, we enjoy it. And so when we look at the meaning to stop working, to actually feel the, the let, when, when you rest, you, you let go of tension. You let go of that stress. You take a holiday. If we look at Sabbath that way, instead of a restriction, the problem comes in is that sometimes um, there's so many distractions in the world. There are so many devices and little things that Satan will put in our way. So that when God said, remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. And he says, six days labor. And he wants us to remember his example. He wants us to remember that he is the creator. And so in our ceasing from work, from our resting, from taking a holiday, he wants to be a part of it. And that's where sometimes we get confusion and mixed up. If everything we want to do during this day of rest excludes God, pushes him away, then we need to re-examine well, what is our relationship? Because there's nothing about God that should be so distasteful or that should be um, 
in the way of our resting, in the way of our enjoying the Sabbath. Him being a part of it should make it even more joyful. And then one of the things that came up in this lesson that was last week, and I thought I need to highlight this, especially for new believers. There was a statement and I highlighted it. Death is certainly an enemy and will one day be abolished. And however much we mourn and miss, you know, our loved ones who have died, why is it comforting to know that at least for now, they are at rest? And um, some people believe that those who have died have already gone to heaven. They can look down on us and they can see what we're doing. There are so many texts in the Bible, and I won't get into it now, um, and I'm sure there will be times when things will come up on what happens with people, what happens when people die. Um, those who have studied with me, we, we studied um, deeply all so many texts on what happens with people dying. And the conclusion is they are resting in the grave, resting. But at the second coming, the dead in Christ will rise first. And those who are alive will be caught up with them in the sky. And we will then experience the eternal life. They haven't started the eternal life yet. And we can talk about that later. And if anybody has a question about it, um, you can contact me. But there are many, many, many texts in the Bible that help us to understand that. Okay. And now, any questions before we try to get to today's lesson? Restless and rebellious. But before we get to today's lesson, any questions on anything in the past? Maybe when you studied, you were thinking, oh, I wish we were in our Sabbath school class because I could ask this. Or maybe you underlined something. Is there anything lingering from the last quarter or even from last week before we get into today's lesson? So I take the silence as a no, and now it is actually 11 o'clock, and we're just beginning today's lesson. So we're going to study this lesson the way we usually study a lesson. And so if we only get to Wednesday, or if we only get to Thursday, or wherever we get, we'll pick it up next week, and we'll try to... Carol? Yes. Oh, I just got unmuted. I'm sorry. I couldn't figure out your phone. I did have something I wanted to say because you asked the question. Yes. Why is it comforting to know that people are at risk? And I wanted to say two things. One is because we'll get to see them again. And two, the idea that they're looking down at us would not be uh, a, a pleasant heaven if they could look down and see all the things we're going through that that wouldn't be a joy for them to be in heaven looking down at all the terrible stuff that's happening. Yeah, especially over the last four years <laughs> and all that's going on with Black Lives Matter and that. Yes, yes. And if heaven was so beautiful and the streets and, you know, that they, uh, the way they describe it, who would be, even think about looking back, back you know, from where... <laughs> You wouldn't want to look there. <laughs> right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. All right. So now this entire quarter, remember, is about rest. But the rest that we are studying includes peace and joy and comfort, physical rest, mental rest, emotional rest. All of that is included. So the second lesson, restless and rebellious. 
And uh, before we even look at the memory verse, which we'll go back to, it's, uh, we're told, and where did I put it? In this week's study, and this is what this whole week was about. In this week's study, we look at some examples of strange human restlessness that was brought about by not impending natural disaster like earthquakes and things like that, but by the basic sinfulness of fallen human beings who were not resting in what Christ offers, uh, who uh, not resting in all that Christ offers all who come to him in faith and obedience. Now, what I see that this lesson did and, and is doing today as we study it, while God wants us to have rest and peace and joy, people get restless and they get rebellious because of their restlessness. One of the things that the lesson did not bring out, but you can't miss it. Do you think Satan wants us to be at rest? Do you think he wants us to have joy and peace? So while God has, has provided for us to have this rest, to have this joy, to have this peace, Satan is constantly gonna try to mess it up. So what we're looking at in this lesson are examples of times and people and situations where there could have been peace and there could have been joy, but people became restless, they became rebellious. Now in the introduction to this lesson, there is a, um, some, some science stuff in there about how animals um, can feel things before humans. When there's gonna be an earthquake, the animals get a warning and they know that something is about to happen. Do you remember when there was that um, tsunami that wiped out a lot of people? It was in Asia and it was several, several years ago, but the animals all were noticed it, that they were going to higher ground and they were finding shelter before the tsunami hit. And in the introduction, to this lesson that's worldwide, um, there is mentioned something that happened in the DC area in 2011. Do you remember we had an earthquake in the DC area in 2011? And it's mentioned in, the, in this lesson. And it said <clears throat> a few minutes before the 5.8 magnitude earthquake that hit the Washington DC area, August 23, 9, uh, 2011, some of the animals at the, at the zoo started behaving strangely. I, didn't, I never heard that. And here we are living in that area and I remember that earthquake. But now we find out in our Sabbath school lesson that on that day, some of the animals in the zoo started behaving strangely. Among them <clears throat> were the lemurs, I think I'm saying it right, I hope so, who began calling loudly for about 15 minutes before the ground started shaking. So what the lesson was saying, animals can feel things, but humans get restless and rebellious Sometimes when Satan is bringing something up and he's causing us to become distracted and we need to be aware of that. Any questions on that introduction? Okay. No, I was just gonna say we felt that earthquake in Philly and this is back when I had a dog and he started acting up. 
Wow. I was at a doctor's appointment with my mom and we were, it was like a quick thing. So we, me and the dog were waiting outside and he like jumped up and started circling around me. And I was like, what's wrong? And then he sat back down and a few minutes later, I felt a rumble and I was thinking it was the subway. And then I realized I wasn't near the subway. Mm -hmm. And then I went online and saw that it was an earthquake. So did you relate the dog's behavior to it? Mm -hmm. Yep. Okay. I was like, oh, he must have realized what was about to happen. Uh -huh. Okay. Yep. Well, this is, and so, and so what the lesson is trying to say is that sometimes when, when Satan is trying to, to do something, uh, he's trying to cause a distraction. He's disturbing our spirit, just like these animals, they can feel it. We feel it, but we become sometimes rebellious and not understanding. When we, when we understand that Satan is doing this, that's when we need to get on our knees and get back to the source of rest and peace so that we won't fall into the traps that Satan is setting up for us. Israel must have felt restless and unhappy when they departed Sinai on their way to Canaan. More than one year had passed since they left Egypt. They were ready to enter the promised land. And so something happens. The first place following their departure from Sinai finds them complaining. Sinai is where they confirm their covenant with God. He wants them to be his people. They say, yes, anything you ask, we will do. So they start complaining. And because of time, we won't read all of this, but somebody who already studied the lesson you can look at what I've highlighted. They've, they've only been away around a year, about a year. They have um, met God at Mount Sinai. He gives them the Ten Commandments. They say, everything you do, Lord, everything you say, Lord, we will do. And then they start complaining. So what are they complaining about? What distraction, see, is Satan throwing before them and then they fall for the okie doke? What do they complain about? What's this story about? They're eating of the manna. Mm -hmm. Isn't that funny? Because appetite is one of the ways that Satan distracts us too, doesn't he? A lot of addictions, a lot of illnesses, a lot of problems have to do with appetite and here is one of their it wasn't really their first complaint but it was one of them and so who wants to go ahead and tell so what happened so what i noticed was um they it was a mixed multitude they started complaining about uh the cucumber the fish the leeks and all that how they could have been in egypt eating well and they were out in the wilderness eating this manna so i looked up what the color of the manna looked like and it's very unappealing to the eye so you have this dark i'm imagining sticky substance god is providing you and then you're comparing that to what you were eating while you were enslaved in egypt and you're preferring that over what god is providing Okay. They remember. And we do that all the time. Mm -hmm. Go ahead. And we do that all the time. We never satisfied with what God is doing in our lives. Right. This is what Sister um, Stella is saying. They remembered the food, but they forgot the slavery and the unbelievable yeah. hardship. They had a hard time. Yeah. Things weren't going yeah. well. But they forgot about that. Now they're complaining about yeah. the food and not trust. And, and we do, and we and, and we do that every day, Sister Cantu. Yes. We we'll never content with what life is, and we always find ourselves complaining 
this, that, you know, but before we trust God more, we complain. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so the rest, the, the joy, the comfort, the, the um, release from tension that we could have, we, we don't have it because we're so busy complaining and not looking at all of the, the good things. So now in the story of how God responded, it's a long story and I don't want to take all the time, but I picked out um, just some of the verses. The, how does God respond to these complaints is given in Numbers chapter 11, verses 16 to 33. So instead of reading all of that, I just picked some um, verses, 16, 19, 20, 21, 22, 23, and 31. So Doris, can you do Numbers 11, 16, 19, 20? And then Letty, can you do yeah. numbers 11 and you pick up 21, 22, 23, and 31? Okay. Because the story from the Bible, I like the way <laughs> um, it is there. So how does God respond to these complaints? Ready, Doris? Can't hear you, unmute. Okay. And you're gonna and you're gonna do, scripture again. You're gonna do numbers 11, 16, 19, and 20. And then Letty, you're gonna take. 21, 22, 23, and 31. Numbers 11, verses 16 is, And the Lord said unto Moses, Gather unto me 70 men of the elders of Israel, whom thou knowest to be the elders of the people and officers over them, and bring them unto the tabernacle of the congregation that they may stand there with thee. That's 16, 19 says, ye shall not eat one day, nor two days, nor five days, neither 10 days, nor 20 days. 16, 19, and what's the other one? 20 and 20, 20, 20. And, 20. and even a whole month until it come out of your nostrils and it be loth lossom unto you because that ye have despised the Lord which is <clears throat> among you and have wept before him saying why came we forth out of Egypt Okay, in Numbers eleven twenty one, yes, to twenty three. Mm -hmm. But Moses said, "Here I am among six hundred thousand men on foot, and you say I will give them meat to eat for a whole month. Would they have enough if flocks and herds were slaughtered for them? Would they have enough if all the fish in the sea were caught for them?" The Lord answered Moses, "Is the Lord?" arm too short now you will see whether or not what i say will come true for you now 31 is it mm -hmm. 31 31 oh, now a wind went out from the lord and drove quail in from the sea it scattered them up to two cubits deep all around the camp as far as a day's walk in any direction Okay, so now these people complain. 
So the first- Or they get more than what they want. Right. They, well, first, first God says, I'm going to set up a council to work with, with Moses. That's going to be important a, a little bit down the line. But God wants not just Moses, but the whole council to kind of follow the direction he's going in. And then he says, okay, they, they want some food. They want some meat. I'll give it to them. And when he says, I'll give them enough for a whole month. And Moses wonders, well, where are we going to get all enough meat for a month? And then the wind blows and the quail come. And of course, we know the rest of the story. <laughs> um, something is happening to my screen. Okay. Um, so what's the rest of the story? <laughs> what, what we know, and it's not actually, that's not the important part. The important part is that God says, okay, you want me to, I'm going to give it to you. But he knows their complaint, even though, and, and Whitney, I hadn't looked that up to see what that meat looked like, what that manna looked like. But besides just complaining about the food, they were complaining about God and not trusting him and not resting in his promises and not um, having the faith. And we're going to be okay. So, so all this meat comes and what happens? And it wasn't even in the rest of this story, but those of us who know, what happened? Gluttonous. They, put it <laughs> they, and right. they died in their sin. <laughs> <laughs> they got so sick. They, they ate so much. They got tired. Of it. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's one incident of restlessness and rebelliousness. The next incident is with Aaron and Miriam. And um, we're not going to read through, through it all because I'm looking at the time and we're only on Monday. But in, in Numbers um, 11 that was just read, in verse 16, when God told um, Moses to bring a council together, well, Moses and, I mean, Aaron and Miriam, they kind of didn't like the fact that now God is bringing a council together. It was just Moses and Aaron and Miriam making the decisions. Miriam and Aaron are thinking, now why do we need all these other people? And not only do they complain about that, the main focus of their complaint is about the prophetic gift. And so they're complaining about how God is working. They're really complaining about God, but they don't say that. So what do they say instead? What do they... What does it look like they're complaining about? Somebody who studied the lesson. What, are the, what does it look like they're complaining about? Or what do their words indicate they're complaining about? It wasn't Is this about one? Moses, right? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. uh, who's in charge? They're complaining about that, but somebody says something about the wife. Moses tell her. Go ahead. It's not. It's not that is the time. Then the Lord um would make Moses to serve the lepers. Yes, but that's that's the um, punishment. But what was that? What did they actually? They're complaining. They're really deep down inside complaining about God, not um just using them more. Wasn't it Moses' wife, mm -hmm. wife's father who suggested that, that Moses get some help? Well, that was some time and ago. So, that was some time ago, but in this incident. Was, was it his, that his wife was black? 
Yeah. yeah. Ethiopian. Yeah. Mm hmm. So they're saying, and he's got that wife, and she's a Cushite. <laughs> and we know that Cush, Cushites mean the, the Black people um, of the time. And so. But you know, mm -hmm. think about this. In, 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 from creation, people that was like Black. Yeah. You know? Because they were made out never of get the dirt. A question to it. Yeah. <laughs> they were made from the dirt. Most dirt is dark. Now there is some there is some light sand. That light sand doesn't stick together good. It's the dirt. It's that dark, rich dirt that sticks together. It's dark. But anyway, the the point is Aaron and Moses. Aaron and and um and his sister, Miriam. <laughs> Miriam, they're restless and now they become rebellious because right. Satan gets into it. He doesn't want things to go well. He doesn't want you to rest and be at peace. He mm -hmm. wants you to find something to cause a little tension, something to cause a little confusion. So here's another example of that. And so they are they don't like the fact that um moses has the prophetic gift they think they have it too and they do but not to the extent that moses does and now you've got he brought in another council of people and we're supposed to be the council and then he got that black wife and why, why <laughs> <is that? laughs> you know they bring that into it and god is not pleased with them um, doing all this complaining. So God's response is immediate and it leaves no room for interpretation. <laughs> he doesn't like what they're doing and he doesn't uh, play around. God's punishment of Miriam with leprosy Temporary, mm -hmm. temporary leprosy communicates vividly his displeasure with both Miriam and, and Aaron and helps bring about the attitude change that this family needs. But with this whole incident, our lesson brings out a comparison. And... Um, it's in the next, no, 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 no. I don't want to go there yet. I don't want to go to the next day. But there's a comparison because of how Moses reacts. Some, some, somebody who studied, t t talk about that. It drew the God, together. God is displeased. He, he strikes Miriam with leprosy. Um, Aaron cries out uh, to Moses to intercede on her behalf, and Moses cries out to God on both his brother and his sister's behalf. And it's how we should be as a family to intercede for each other and bring each other back to the throne of God. Right. There's an intercession going on that sometimes other people or something is going on in their lives. Um, tension is building up. They're under stress. Sometimes the stress they cause themselves. Sometimes they didn't cause it themselves. But others help and intercede. There's intercession that we can help and bring about relief when we have a relationship with God. All right. Now, restlessness. Go ahead, somebody's saying something. Go ahead before I go on to Tuesday. No, I'm somebody... going to Tuesday lesson. Mm -hmm. Anything else before we go on to Tuesday? It's 11.27. Okay, so we don't have a lot of time. So what we'll do, um, let's do Tuesday. There's 10 more minutes. And and see if we have any questions of anything up through that. And then we can put Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday with next week's lesson, and we'll be able to do it. But let's, let's, let's look at Tuesday. Restlessness leads to rebellion. 
Um, they're now the, the children of Israel in the wilderness. Now they're at the border of Canaan. And Moses sends 12 spies to explore the land. And their report is extraordinary. And we're not gonna take the time to read everything, but somebody who knows what did they report? 12 spies go in, they're, they're, they're getting ready to go into the promised land. 12 spies go in and what do they report? Bad news. Say it out loud. Was bad news? Yeah. The, the, the giant, they were so big and we can't sing it right. They, they, they didn't trust God enough to know that God could, in spite of the size of the giant, that they could go, mm -hmm. but they had doubt in their mind. Okay, 10. And 10 of the spies. Trust God. Mm -hmm. 10 spies give that. We can't do this. Uh uh. Yeah, you know, we, we can't take, mm -hmm. we can't go into that land. Two of the spies mm -hmm. say, yeah, we can. We can yeah, do it. Yeah. So the unfaithful spies were loud in denouncing what the two faithful spies were saying. Yeah. And yeah. so right then, however, the glory of God manifests itself publicly. So when you read the story, it seems that the entire scene has been frozen. And we're now privy to listen to God's conversation with Moses. God recognizes that even though this, you know, people pick the stones, they picked up some stones. And these stones were meant for Moses and Caleb and Joshua. So the, the rebellious people said, we can't go into this land Let's throw, a, let's throw these stones at our leaders. That's how they responded when Moses was leaning toward what Caleb and Joshua was saying, we can take this land, we can. But God says they're picking up these stones, aiming them at Moses and Caleb and Joshua, but they really want to throw those stones at me. They really want to throw the stones at me. So we're going to kind of stop there, pick this up next week. Any questions? What do, what do you, any thoughts, anything you want to um, ask or anything you want to share? Anybody? I, I think that this lesson taught me to you know sometimes we're not, we're not trusting God as we should. We always have doubts. Mm -hmm. We might pray and when we pray, we still have doubts. I wonder if this, you know, and, and when you think about the lesson, it's things from cre creation from Christ. We are still doing it today. You know, we can say we pray, and when we're done, we still have doubts that, you know, this thing can happen. But I thank God for God to give me that understanding that now, never mind what it is, whatever God says, whatever happens, maybe that is the way it's supposed to be, but I never try to doubt the Lord that this wouldn't happen. I have that confidence in him that. He's always, he always listening. He always ready. Whatever he do, that is the right choice that he, that he thinks that is good for us. Mm -hmm. That is my little example. That's excellent. That's excellent. You know, as you were saying that, Sister Stella, and I'm thinking about this story, thinking about how um, sometimes we're really angry with God and we don't like the way God has put things in place or maybe the opposite obligations he's put on us. Um, they're really for our own good, but we, we, yeah. we strike out at other people sometimes. 
we strike out at them because they're the ones telling us. Um, anybody else have something you want to share? Okay, if not, I don't want to go into the next section because then they'll be throwing us out of the room. And I want to say that. So for next week, we're going to start with um, Intercessor on Wednesday. We'll do Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday. We'll do it quickly, and then we'll go on to next week's lesson. Um, is there someone who would like to volunteer to give us a closing prayer for our class before they throw us out? Put us with everybody else. I, like I, Sister Kanti. Thank you. Loving Father, loving fathers, we come before you, thanking you, Lord Jesus, that I could hear Sister Kanti write this manual away. Lord Jesus, thank you for our, our teacher. Thank you for everybody that take part, oh God. Father, keep us. Bless us. Bless our class and help us to grow more and more. I ask his mercy in all the name we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.